In September, Japan shocked global markets by expanding its export blacklist, adding more than a hundred Chinese companies in a single move. These weren't small firms. They represented the cutting edge of China's technological rise, semiconductors, quantum computing, artificial intelligence, and even advanced cooling systems used for chip manufacturing. Some Western analysts called it the harshest export crackdown ever imposed by Japan, perhaps even tougher than Washington's own restrictions. Yet what caught the world off guard wasn't Japan's decision itself, but how swiftly China struck back, leaving Tokyo with little ground to stand on. So why did Japan take such an aggressive step? Who truly pushed this policy from behind the scenes? And how might China respond to what looks like a new front in the global chip war? Let's break it down. Semiconductors are often described as the oil of the digital age, the foundation of everything from smartphones to satellites. Whoever masters chip production effectively controls the modern world's most valuable resource. That's why beginning in 2022, the United States moved to choke China's access to advanced semiconductor materials and manufacturing equipment. Cutting supply lines from top to bottom, over 15,000 Chinese firms have since found themselves blacklisted by Washington. And America hasn't stood alone. Its allies have followed in lockstep. In Europe, the Netherlands recently invoked national security to seize control of a major Chinese semiconductor firm, freezing assets worth nearly 15 billion yuan and ousting its Chinese executives. Meanwhile, Japan has steadily tightened its own grip on technology exports. At the start of 2025, Tokyo announced new restrictions on chip-related equipment advanced software, and quantum computing technologies. Officially, these rules weren't aimed at any specific country, but everyone knew which direction the pressure was pointing. That same month, the U.S. also expanded its export control framework, introducing a tiered access system for advanced computing chips, placing China in the most restricted category possible. Then came September, when Japan once again escalated, blacklisting 110 Chinese institutions and companies across fields from lithography to AI and quantum tech. Unlike the US, which focused mainly on high-end chip models, Japan targeted the entire supply chain, even cooling systems and secondary components essential to chip making. Under these new rules, Chinese firms now face an uphill battle. Export approvals from Japan will become slower, costlier, and more uncertain. Even companies from friendly nations must now prove their shipments won't be resold to China through third parties. Before Japan's decision, the U.S. had just added 23 more Chinese entities to its own restricted list, 13 of them tied directly to semiconductor manufacturing. Tokyo's synchronized timing was no coincidence. It was a clear show of coordination with Washington's broader campaign to contain China's technological ascent. But Japan's motivations go deeper than alliance politics. This is also a story of lost dominance and pride. In the 1980s, Japan ruled the semiconductor world. Giants like Toshiba, Hitachi, and NEC commanded more than half of global market share. Yet by the early 2000s, the tide had turned. South Korea's Samsung and Taiwan's TSMC surged ahead, leaving Japan's once mighty chip sector lagging behind. Today, Japan's foundries can't mass-produce chips smaller than 7 nanometers, while China's SMIC has already achieved trial runs at that level. In 2022, Tokyo tried to reverse its decline by backing a new domestic champion, Rapidus, with over $21 billion in state support to develop 2 nanometer process technology. But the key know-how came from IBM in the US, and mass production isn't expected before 2028, five years behind TSMC and Samsung. The truth is harsh. Japan, once a semiconductor superpower, has been sidelined from the race for cutting-edge chips. As its chip dominance faded, Japan began losing ground even in areas it once controlled. Take silicon carbide wafers, a vital component in power electronics. Just a few years ago, Japan's 6-inch SIC wafers cost over $1,300 apiece, and Chinese buyers had to wait months to secure limited supplies. But Chinese manufacturers have since achieved mass production, slashing prices to around $800 per wafer, nearly 40% cheaper. Japan's ROHM had no choice but to drop prices to $900 and rush development of larger 8-inch wafers just to stay competitive. The same story unfolded in other sectors. JS Foundry, once a key supplier of low-voltage MOSFET chips used in home appliances, saw its market collapse when Chinese producers began offering identical chips for half the price. Costs that once stood at 40,000 yen per thousand units fell to 18,000 yen, cutting Japanese suppliers out of the market entirely. As Chinese appliance makers switched to domestic alternatives, JS Foundry's losses piled up, until the company ultimately declared bankruptcy in 2023. For Japan, this isn't just a trade dispute. It's a fight to reclaim relevance in an industry it once dominated. For China, it's proof that technological self-reliance is no longer a dream. It's already reshaping the balance of power in the global semiconductor world. Japan understands that if it fails to act decisively against China's rapidly expanding semiconductor sector, 
the dominance of low-cost Chinese chips could soon reshape the global market beyond recovery. Yet despite repeated attempts by Washington to contain Beijing's progress, China has consistently managed to find its own counterbalance. Now faced with Japan's deliberate challenge, China is unlikely to sit quietly on the sidelines. Japan's weakness lies in a simple truth. It lacks natural resources. Its limited geography and shallow mineral base mean that its rare earth supplies depend almost entirely on imports. In past years, roughly 90% of Japan's total rare earth imports originated from China. Even in 2024, the country imported more than 8,300 tons of these critical materials with over 5,000 tons sourced directly from Chinese producers. That means Tokyo still relies on Beijing for more than 60% of its rare earth supply chain. Since early this year, China has tightened its export rules for rare earth elements, a move that forced Japan to scramble for alternatives. Tokyo responded by deepening cooperation with Washington through a new partnership aimed at reinforcing rare earth security via joint investments and industrial incentives. It also reached out to Australia and India forming a loose coalition to offset Beijing's dominance. However, even with all four countries combined, their rare earth processing capability barely equals a fraction of China's capacity. To reduce this dependency, Japan has also begun investing heavily in recycling initiatives. Through government subsidies and policy backing, companies are being encouraged to extract valuable elements from discarded electronics and automotive components. But these efforts remain small in scale. If China decides to further delay export permits or tighten its approval system, Japan would immediately feel the impact. Nearly every major Japanese industry, especially high-tech manufacturing, relies heavily on a stable flow of rare earth materials. A complete halt in Chinese exports would strike hardest at Japan's automotive industry. The production of a single electric vehicle requires 2 to 3 kilograms of neodymium iron boron magnets, whose strength depends on the addition of the rare element dysprosium. If that supply were cut off, production lines at Toyota, Honda, and other automakers could grind to a halt. Their combined 15% share of the global EV market could evaporate within months. And if the embargo lasted, Japan's auto sector could suffer annual losses surpassing 20 billion US dollars. The damage wouldn't end there. Japan's semiconductor and electronics industries also depend on rare earth materials, which are indispensable for advanced chip fabrication. Elements such as those used in photoresists and sputtering targets cannot be substituted easily. For instance, Renesis Electronics, a key player in Japan's chip industry, requires around 100 tons of rare earth compounds every month to keep its power chip lines running. A disruption in supply would drive up chip prices and delay Japan's efforts to develop its 3 nanometer process, allowing Chinese and South Korean rivals to surge ahead. Rare earths are equally vital to Japan's defense and strategic industries. Components like precision gyroscopes in missile guidance systems or microwave devices in radar technology depend on powerful rare earth magnets. Japan's plan to mass-produce its Type 12 anti-ship missile, for example, has already been delayed partly due to uncertainty over rare earth supplies. This bottleneck directly affects national security, and Tokyo currently has no reliable way to secure sufficient material from alternative sources in the short term. According to Japan's Ministry of Finance, the overall production costs across high-tech industries could rise by as much as 15-22% over the next five years. Such an increase could even push some defense contracts offshore. In this context, Japan's confrontation with China seems poorly calculated. The United States, though also restricting Chinese tech development, tends to use such pressure as a bargaining chip, ultimately steering negotiations toward its own advantage. The trade war between Washington and Beijing proved that both sides understood the cost of prolonged economic hostility. High tariffs hurt not only their industries but also their citizens, forcing both nations back to the negotiation table. Japan, however, appears to be taking a far narrower and more reactionary path. Such moves may win short-term headlines, but in the long run, they risk inviting harsher retaliation from China. If that happens, Japan could find itself facing deeper isolation, a weakened industrial base, and rising costs across its most advanced sectors. Its strategic position in the global economy could erode, leaving it more dependent than ever on the very supply chains it is now challenging. What do you think of Japan's current strategy in this escalating standoff? Don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss our upcoming analyses and global news features.